We're very pleased to be here today with T.D. Barnes. Uh, T.D. is uh, a renowned expert on Area 51 and also a former veteran of the area. He's going to be giving a uh, lecture as part of our Distinguished Lecture Series here at the National Atomic Testing Museum on Friday, September 13th at 6 p.m. So we're really looking forward to that lecture. And this uh, interview today is a little bit of a, a lead up to that, an inter introduction of TD. And, and let's, let's just start with, with some of your background. Can you, uh, can you give us a little bit of information on who, you, who you are? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was, um, kind of a long story, I was a uh, served in Korea, uh, Army Intelligence. And came out of Korea, I got into surface air missiles. And I was a professional student. Um, at Fort Bliss, Texas, uh, one missile, uh, air defense missile after another, and radar, you know, it involved everything. The, I got involved with the CIA while I was out there, having to do with Area 51. We were getting ready to build a spy plane to replace the U-2, and, they, and the, we had discovered that the Russians had a new radar. We, we, the CIA had picked up reflections of this new radar bouncing off ICBMs inside of Russia, and they said, whoa, we're building a plane to replace the U-2. Will it be able? Will they be able to shoot it down? So we were all flying you know, with the U-2, and we knew the U-2 was going to get shot down. We mm -hmm. we, gave, we didn't figure it last over 18 months, so they were advancing that quickly. So the um, the Russians moved one through Cuba in 1960, long long before the missile crisis. Part of the missile buildup for the missile crisis, we knew it. So we started flying a ghost plane out of Bridge Air Force Base next door to area, uh, uh, Fort Bliss, where I was stationed. In I Texas. Was, Yes, and we, and the, we had a C-97, just loaded with electronics, and, um, and they recruited me for it because I was well advanced into missiles in, in Russian because we you were know, trained the, against the Russians electronic countermeasures and, and electronic counter countermeasures. So I got recruited to fly on this ghost plane, and we would fly at, at Cuba. They'd turn on this radar, and then we could electronically answer it any way we wanted to make it like it's tracking one plane, two planes, ten planes, going, coming. We could just, we play games, but we'd make them turn up the power. And, and the bottom line is, we deter, uh, from that project, Project Palladium, we determined, yes, they will be able to sh uh, eventually shoot down anything we fly over Russia. And that uh, was called satellite. Project Palladium. Pro project Palladium. So how do you spell that? That's P-L-A-D. Uh, I, you know, Palladium. Uh, okay. Yeah, Palladium. Yes. Okay. So that's that's a uh, known. Um, yes, it's a known. It was, event uh, now has been declassified. It was headed up by Doctor uh, uh, Jean Potique was the head of that uh, with the CIA. And um, so then what we did is we put up a big antenna dish in New Jersey and aimed it at the moon, right right outside of Morgantown, right off the turnpike. And in 30 days, we had used the location of every, uh, every uh, tall king radar inside of Russia, just from refle reflections off the moon. I'll give you an example of some of this stuff. But this had to do with Area 51 because it affected this plane because we never flew this plane over mm -hmm. Russia, even though we were building it for that purpose. So that was the background that brought you to Area 51. But let's, can you give us a little uh, background on Area 51 itself? It's a very popular topic and there seems to be a lot of mystery about it mainly because a lot of people don't know much about it but what was the origin of area 51 when the when the during the cold war the russians put up started the iron curtain and we we they were bragging they had better missiles they had better uh, bombers we didn't know but what they did so they put the first satellite in space first man in space they were ahead of us in everything that we we were trying to do at the time and we had already lost 200 uh, air crewmen inside of russia taking what we call ferret flights. We'd dash in, try to get some photographs, and then shoot us down. So we decided we needed to build a U-2. And they first approached the Air Force to do it. And General May just flat refused to build a plane that didn't have uh, guns and drop bombs. And he certainly wasn't going to build a plane with one engine. So the, and then the, um, the president got to thinking about it and he said, well, I wouldn't want anyone in uniform in the plane anyway if we're flying over Russia because if they're in uniform, it's an act of war. But if mm -hmm. they're a civilian, it's, um, it's an incident. It says, all right, CIA, you're going to do it. So the CIA got selected to build to. They needed a place to test it. So they started looking at all the lake beds and places because they needed a remote site that they could test it without it, but anyone knowing it. Because it, it was more highly classified than the atomic bomb program, the Manhattan program. So the, uh, Dick Bissell 
And one of his colonels remembered this little Groom Lake. They, during World War II, they had that, this practice, uh, uh, target practice there. And they flew over that, and, and it, uh, it was just perfect. And Nevada was perfect because during the, the uh, World War II, the military had moved all the first line of defense from the West Coast to Nevada. The Navy had moved to Nevada, the Air Force, the Marines, the Army, because they thought the Japanese were going to take the West Coast. So you had all this military here in Nevada already. We had only 237,000 people in the entire state. So what better place to put a little operation right in the middle of all this other activity? And it was secret. They said it, this is a NASA project. They're going to be flying a new plane we're building to test high altitude uh, weather research. Now, at this time, it was right adjacent to the Nevada test site that opened in 1951. In exactly. the early days, they were doing atmospheric nuclear testing, so there had to be a close tie-in with the, the Nevada test site. The AEC was one of our partners. They gave us the cover. We, you, the AEC will give you, your cover will be your part of the test site, even though we weren't, because, you know, the, the, the uh, test site was AEC, Atomic Energy Commission at the time, and we were the Department of Defense you know, two different animals. So, but we, they, the, the um, AEC gave us a cover and, and we actually used the badges, same badges that they use out at the uh, test site, everything. So by all appearances, we were working at the test site. But that's how they kept us in, and, and everybody knew was out there at the time. They just didn't know what we was doing. So when did you actually come to the, or the Area 51 work? I came, I came to Nevada in 64, and I was attached to the um, NASA High Range Tracker Station at Beatty, which is 45 miles from Area 51. It was what we call the Seven Sisters. It was um, seven radar sites, the other six were Air Defense Command. And we would monitor what was flying out of Area 51, plus our other missions. And then they brought me from there to Area 51, right at the end of the Oxcart, to get some, some Mark III radar cross section. Uh, so I was experienced in high-speed radar and, and targets. So they brought me out there for that, then I stayed for the MIG programs and stealth and that sort of thing. So you were there for many years. I'll explain how, how it worked. You know, it, it was a, a um, CIA operation, yet less than 5% of the people ever affiliated with Air Force knew the CIA was even there. They, had, they did not have a need to know. You had two classes of people, the permanent party people like myself. There's 23 of us. We were special projects. We were for the Science and Technology Division of CIA. And then you had your cooks and, and those people. They could live in Vegas. No one else could even live in this state. Everybody working out there had to live elsewhere. Most of them went to California. Mm -hmm. Like the, the pilots, they attached them to March Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. That was the cover story. But they didn't fly at March. They flew at Area 51. They, they had to commute, and uh, so it's, and it's still that way. But that, but it, it was a place where you commuted into. Um, we went, we went up on Friday morning, came on. Um, I mean, uh, Monday morning, came on Friday night. So you stayed there during the week, but you lived in Las Vegas. We lived in, yeah, we were allowed to live in Las Vegas because I was already in Nevada because I was on the the um, high range mm -hmm. radar. But but everyone, we were the permanent party. Everyone else was customers. The CIA actually set up a business there. And, and the Air Force or the other agencies, the Navy, anyone that was doing anything out there, they were the customer. And they were different from us. We did not associate with them. They weren't even allowed by building. It, it was that, you know, compartmentalized. And that's the point you were making to me. Things were very compartmentalized, so people didn't know what everybody else was doing unless they had a need to know. You had to have a need to know, and even in my group of 23, as, as the base or the facility grew, it wasn't a base at the time, as the station grew, the, uh, uh, we would have different customers maybe among my group. And you knew basically what they were doing and, and we helped each other, hey, Joe, give me a hand with this. But you didn't ask who you're doing this for or how does it work or, or any, you just didn't ask questions. It was that compartmentalized. But the most, anyone that had nothing to do with our program weren't even allowed in our building. You, you were telling me a really fascinating story, and I had never heard this, that there were uh, uh, test pilots, so to speak, that were doing air sampling during some of the actual atomic test out of Area 51. Is that correct? Exactly. The, the first uh, 
we, our first detachment, we had six uh, pilots, Air Force pilots, we trained for the flight of the U-2. All of them were F-84 pilots. Which, uh, most of them had originated out of Turner Air Force Base in Georgia. Four of them that we recruited was actually flying F-84s out at the Nevada test site, flying through the mushroom clouds as they're sitting off the bombs, sampling, doing sampling. We had iron uh, aprons that they wore over them. Uh, the planes, were, of course, were hot when they got out. So we had a fort lift. They wouldn't let them step off onto the fort lift to get them out of it. And then we'd hose the planes down, or they would. I wasn't part of that. They'd hose them down, clean them up, and go again. And we lost one pilot during that operation. The plane flew right into the, the, the mushroom, and they never found the plane again, or the pilot. Never. That's interesting. That, that would be a fascinating story for a lot of our visitors because people come here, they're interested in Area 51, but then they see there's this close connection, e even just necessarily from a geographical standpoint, they're side by side. Uh, and so there, you had talked about other ways that there was a tie-in on some of the same contractors worked at both uh, places. Uh, yeah, we, uh, Area 51, uh, the AEC, Mercury in particular, was the base camp for the, for the Atomic Energy Commission. That was where we got our, our, our haircuts or what the church or any, the AEC furnished all those facilities for the people in Area 51. And, and we actually had softball teams. We would, the 41ers would play against the, uh, the AEC guys and that sort of thing. But uh, just about all of our support uh, services was at Mercury. Because they, they, the CIA at the time didn't anticipate those of us working out there coming to Vegas over four times a year. We, they figured they'd live out there, and, but as it grew and it changed, then some of us became permanent parties. We did, of course, live here. That's interesting. I get a lot of questions when I give tours of the museum. They say, well, how did you get the name Area 51? And, of course, I point out on our map of the test site that they divided it up into grids called areas. Now, I assume that's perhaps how we've got Area 51? That's it, exactly. It was a, the AEC had, had gridded off the area, and even though it was outside of the uh, AEC territory, they had uh, labeled it as Area 51, and, and that's what we accepted. A lot of people, you know, we always said we never talked about Area 51. We worked out there. We never called it that. We always had the, it was Watertown was first. It became the ra ranch or the Paradise Ranch. Mm -hmm. During the MIG program, it became Red Square. Uh, for the Air Force guys flying in, on the running range, they called it the box. But now as they de the CIA declassified everything, they called it Area 51 all the time in their own internal documents. Mm -hmm. But we didn't call it that if we call it anything at all. Mm -hmm. But we didn't talk about it, quite frankly. But the, the CIA period was a distinct period. I mean, today, we still have Area 51, but it's an Air Force base, right? It's not CIA. Uh, yeah, the CIA, um, uh, one of the reasons, I, I think it's kind of interesting to, why the CIA was picked beside, for the U-2, obviously, they wanted civilians. But to, to manage the base, the Air Force has got a chain of command. And they rotate the people every two or three years. Well, CIA doesn't have that. And they, they, they felt that they needed people out there that would stay there indefinitely. And, um, and, this way, and even though we had Air Force there, they were support. They worked for the CIA. The commander of the Air Force reported directly to a fellow named Jack Ledford. He was a colonel and later promoted to Brigadier General. Attached to the CIA, they reported to him. The May, of course, General May wanted to know what we was doing. But they wouldn't tell him. He did, he did not have a need to know. So the, so the Air Force, everybody out there worked for the CIA, even though they wore the uniform. Mm -hmm. And a lot, but that's what's funny, a lot of the airmen and whatever never knew that. They did not know that they worked for the CIA. But you, of course, your commander did. So it was so compartmentalized. Mm -hmm. But at, at some point, you were telling me, the, the technical definition of the CIA, they were not supposed to have a domestic operation, so that's why it eventually become an Air Force base, is that correct? The CIA in 1962 formed the uh, Science and Technology uh, Directorate. And uh, um, Dr. Bud Whelan was the head of it. And it was, but because of what we've done in Area 51, we was, we'd, we'd done the, the U-2 and was getting into stealth. CIA was really, really big into stealth. The A-12 was the, our first stealth, stealth plane. So. They actually identified it as a station, and you actually looked on you looked on their uh, 
uh, of course, it's classified time, you get them now. The list of their stations they had around the world, you'd had all of them, Turkey, Japan, all the, and Area 51. Well, the CIA, by law, is not allowed to have a station in the United States. They're not allowed to operate in the United States, you know, of that nature. And in 79, we, the CIA got in trouble over the Vietnam. They were tracking protesters and this sort of thing mm -hmm. inside of the United States. And they, Congress clipped their wings. You're not supposed to do that. That's the, that's the FBI's job. And then they realized that we're sitting here saying we got a station in Nevada. No way, Jose. And so they shut it down, and the Air Force officially took over. That's not to say the CIA moved out, but it, changed, it became Air Force. And that's when everybody learned about CIA, I mean, about the uh, Area 51. Area 51. The minute the Air Force took over, the word got out, and then that became one of the big mysteries. What in the world had CIA been doing for 20 years that we don't know about? And that started all this UFO stuff and all that. Because people's imagination run wild. Because we'd been there 20 years mm -hmm. doing things. Well, of course, everybody always asks us about the, the UFO stories. And it, we address it today with pop culture. It's an interesting pop culture phenomenon. Uh, even recently in the news, you know, there's, there's been a lot of sightings and things. But just recently I was reading there was a congressman. And there's real concern that maybe some of these sightings aren't aliens from another world, but it could be advanced technology of China or Russia in autonomous aerial vehicles or AI. So uh, th there's a lot of dimension. When you say UFO, it doesn't necessarily mean we're talking about Martians from another planet. Uh, no one's talked about this, but the, all the sightings they've seen, they have been picked up stuff and locked it onto them. Every one of them has been one single sy system. It's a new system that the Navy's got. Mm -hmm. And I'd almost guarantee that we're doing palladium again. We're testing that system, and we're making it think it's seeing things. Because we did it in 1960 with the Russians. Mm -hmm. And we can do that. We can, that's part of our technology. So we're, they've got a new, Navy's got a new device out there, and we're testing it, and we're making it think, seeing something and playing games with it. And, of course, it's probably classified. It would be classified. But the, in my opinion, that's what's going on. And the, the UFO uh, label would be a, a good cover for that, in a sure, sense. Perfect uh, cover. The UFO thing has always been a good cover for us. Mm -hmm. Because we, we flew a lot of stuff at Area 51 that no one ever knew about. We called them uh, technology um, demonstrators or proof of concept. They would be a prototype of something that would later become something real. For example, the, the, the whale, we call it the Attack at Blue program, became the, B, uh, the B-2 bomber. And it also developed the, uh, our cruise vessels. But we, we had a lot of stuff that just really weird, but all we were doing was testing concepts. And it wasn't the people at CIA doing it. That was Boeing doing it, or Lockheed, or Area 51 is where we tested it. They would develop it somewhere else. Bring it to Area 51, and they would say, show us what you got. Because we had the, the people there and the equipment to evaluate and see if it really was going to work. And that's, what, and that's what, part of the secrecy of Area 51 is, is maybe you've got Boeing and Lockheed, for example, compete with each other on a new plane that they want to sell the Navy. And each of them build it in their own hometowns. They want to test it. They bring us to Area 51. The Navy comes in. He's a customer. They, each of them are the, uh, customers. They'll come in at different times. But they don't want Lockheed knowing what Boeing's got over here. Mm -hmm. So the people out there don't talk. Even though they know what both of them's got, mm -hmm. they keep it a secret. And so that part, a lot of the secrecy is just tr a trade secrecy. Industrial secrecy. Industrial, exactly. Mm -hmm. Because they're not building anything out there. They're testing it out there. Right. It's a laboratory. But from a historical standpoint, uh, most of it has been declassified. You've done great work talking about the history. I saw you on the History Channel last night. You had, you're had you a really uh, uh, well-known, respected authority on the subject, and I think that helps demystify a lot of this. The, uh, about 15 years ago, uh, you know, I'm president of the Roadrunners. That was the association of people that worked out there, uh, CIA, Air Force, uh, different contractors. We started the website, and I got a call from Dr. Bud, uh, Dr. David Robards. He's the chief historian of CIA. He said, we got a problem. We don't know what you guys did out there on a lot of the programs. Because <laughs> when, when the Air Force took over in 79, we boxed everything up, all the documents that everybody one, photographs. We stored them at Norton Air Force Base. 
30, 40 years later, when you got ready to start your classified and stuff, it had disappeared. And when he woke up one morning, so they, we started the Roadrunner website. And, and, and I would get the bios of all the people. And, they, and, that, and then the CIA would they'd have a document. They wouldn't know what it meant. They'd fax it to me. I'd put it on the, on the website and to draw and comment. What, what is this? And that's how they re reconstructed the, the history of what, what we did out there. And you've worked up a three-volume set of books that we're going to stock in our museum store again. They, they're hard to keep on the shelves because they're very popular. Uh, I, yeah, I had, uh, the CIA kind of put me official. Everything I do, I get approved by the CIA, you know, the, the PRB board. And, um, but uh, because I had worked with all the, the pilots, the engineers, everyone was roadrunners, had over 200 bows of people that had never told the story anywhere else. Mm -hmm. I had all this that I could put in that book. There, and now the CIA bought about 700 sets of this book. And, we, and I take people back there every two or three months. And we go back to Langley and we you go sit with the Air Branch and different ones. But they use these books as their reference. You know, here's, like I took Tony Revocker back. He was a U-2 pilot in the SR-71. And I had written about him in the book. So they opened up to that chapter Tony Provocker, mm -hmm. and then they sit there and talk to him, just like we're talking now. And but they knew what kind of questions to ask because they had that. That's a reference book. So Tony was a little funny thing. He, you know, he was there with uh, when we was t uh, training the U two. We we trained one Air Force detachment, and, and Tony was in it. And he had a hard landing, messed up his landing gear a little bit. He climbed out of the plane. He's wearing <laughs> Levi's and and uh, his house shoes. <laughs> Kind of a funny story, but he wasn't planning on <laughs> crash, crashing or anything like that. Well, he didn't really crash, but he did burger up the plane a little bit, you know. But those little stories come out, you know, a lot of funny stories. They, uh, uh, we had a lot of moments like that. Well, it's important history that you're also saving. Now, you've spoken a number of times at our museum as part of our Distinguished Lecture Series, and it's always very popular and well attended when you come. Uh, on September... 13th, Friday, September 13th at 6 p.m. Uh, the title of your talk this time is Project Oxcart, the CIA at Area 51. Is there anything special you want to uh, let us know about your, this upcoming lecture? We've got quite a bit of new, new material. The CIA in, in 2013 declassified just about everything they did out there. So uh, a lot of that is contained in my book. So that's one of the advantages is I was able to use my resources at, at CIA for the book. So I got, you know, it's a, a lot of stuff that's new to the people. But a lot of this new stuff that has come out is, I'll cover some of that, because I've covered the Oscar before. So I'll probably go into a little bit of why, the story of why, when, what, where, and, and who, and just take it from there. And, and this time, I've got quite a bit of video that I could show that's uh, okay. of actual flights. And, and it'll be interesting, I think, people to actually see the buildings, see the people, you know, that was involved. Very good. Well, that sounds, I, a lot of people will be looking forward to that. Uh, it's it's a, gra a vast body of material that you, you cover in all your lectures and in, in this lecture. Is there any um, new particular story you want to add to this, uh, this uh, preamble that we're preparing for the lecture in this video? Well, I might tell them a, a kind of a funny story about the MIG program. You know, MIG, the MIG program is a very important program. And I might cover that. In fact, I will cover some of that. Because that was some of our accomplishments out there needs to be told. And that, you know, why we did it and, and what we accomplished. Because we, that's where uh, Red Flag came from, is what we did at Air 51. Mm -hmm. And our, also the Navy Top Gun. That within two months, the Navy uh, uh, flying against us, we were flying a MIG-21. And they come in with their planes to fly against it. We got a 100% kill against the Navy. And they realized it wasn't a, the plane that they didn't know how to fight. And they immediately started Top Gun just because of what we did at Air 51. And then, and then Red Flag came from that too because the same thing happened with the Air Force. They'd come in with all their different planes, the F-4s, whatever, and we'd wax them every time, even with MiG-17. And they realized that they weren't training their people to fight against the big the planes. It wasn't the planes necessarily. Mm -hmm. They had the strong points, but they had a lot of, we, we, we could outdo them if we knew what to do. And that's what we, what came out of that. And the, 
these MIGs, the Russian MIGs, they were captured or how were they acquired in some cases? We, we got our first MiG-21. It, it had showed up in Vietnam. It was a mystery plane. And we were giving it credit for shooting down all of our people. We lost 15 planes in one day and did shoot down a single one. And, and we credited it with the MiG-21 that shot missiles. Well, uh, Iraqi defected to Israel with a brand new MiG-21. Israel loaned it to us to mm -hmm. test out there. And we made a lot of preparations. But personally, I went back to Wright-Patterson uh, off the NASA range before I went there for one, just to build the black boxes we were going to use to evaluate this MiG-21 out there if it's one. To get radar signatures? All the, all, you know, everything about it. We, we looked at paint. We looked at the rivets. So we tore it down and put it back together again. And, uh, and then we flew it. And, and we flew 100 missions with the MiG-21. And a uh, beautiful plane as far as we changed the tires and changed the oil one time. That's it. It was a workhorse. Uh, it's simple. It's a throwaway. But it got the job done. Well, that had to be quite an experience to, to be part of that history. Uh, and certainly, yeah. I've always told the story, you know, that to some extent, atomic testing helped win the peace of the Cold War. I mean, you were fighting the Cold War, and uh, your contributions in the CIA's efforts out there at Area 51 made a big difference uh, maintaining the peace. Well, what, we, what the CIA determined, well, and, and the other Navy and the Air Force, it took 10 missions in, in Vietnam to learn enough about how to fight that you might survive the, 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 the war. And we decided, let's give these pilots those 10 missions in Nevada, mm -hmm. rather than Vietnam. Rather than so that's exactly what we did. We actually formed a major squadron called the Red Eagles. Uh, Colonel Gail Peck was the head of it. And they, um, we had them at Tonopah. And they would fly against the guys on the Nellis Range. And that would give them their first exposure to MIG, and it's so funny mm -hmm. because they would freeze up first time they saw MIG, just like a deer in headlights. Mm -hmm. They didn't mm -hmm. know how to react. Well, that's very interesting. Uh, well, you're going you're gonna to be covering a lot of uh, material in your talk uh, on uh, September 13th, and we should mention that some of your prior talks have been recorded, and they're on our webpage. We have a YouTube channel. Uh, and also maybe mention again the Roadrunners website. Uh, is there a special address for that, or you just type in Roadrunners? It's Roadrunners International with an E on the, on the international. Okay. Dot com. And um, yeah, it's got a lot of stuff. And then um, we've got a lot of, um, of, of the stuff on the Nevada Aerospace Hall of Fame website, too, okay. because it is carrying on the, you know, the Roadrunners are dying off to maintain our legacy and what they did. The, the Hall of Fame now is, is taking that. Assuming that position, mm -hmm. and not only with them, but with the MIG programs. This year, the, the U-2 is our theme. In November, we'll be inducting um, three U-2 pilots and, and the 14 people that killed on Mount Charleston flying Area 51 and C-54 during the U-2 program. Mm -hmm. And so we'll be inducting them. So that's our theme this year is the U-2. And in fact, we were going to have a U-2 at the Nellis Air Show, and they had to cancel the last minute. Mm -hmm. But we were actually going to have a U2 for our people to see. But but that's, we got a big. But anyway, we 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 really got a, a major oral history program going in Nevada, and we work. With the, Dr. Uh, Robards will be our guest speaker. I think while he, while he's here, Gary Power Jr. is going to be speaking here, here at the uh, at your yes later in the fall. Yeah, and uh, Gary and I have done several appearances. We we do these talks like I'm going to be doing here. We do them at universities. We've done them all over the United States. And a lot of times, Dr. Robard and even Jean Boutique will join me. We'll do them jointly. See, it'll be a CIA-sponsored uh, mm -hmm. talk. Because they're, they're supporting, very supportive of everything we're doing. Because they want that leg legacy out, get the story told. And it's, as we've said this morning, it's very important history, and a lot of people out there have a sincere interest in it. It's not just, uh, you know, the, the UFO crowd, but it's a, it's a true, uh, serious part of our American the, history. The accomplishments it's done, you know, we developed the stealth planes out there. That's a major. And, and that, that was the interesting thing that we got to do, because I, I, I don't know on the ground floor, but even the A-12 spy plane was 90% stealth. It, we tried to make it a stealth plane, but it, it carried 80,000 pounds of fuel. There's no way we could hide that. Plus, you got up to 2,200 degrees in some places, and it, the, even any, anyone with infrared detection could pick it up. So, mm -hmm. uh, 
we should make it totally. But we learned enough on that that we could continue the stealth program. And that's some of the things we did for 10 years after we stopped flying the, the A-12 and the U-2 out there is we were doing stealth and doing the Soviet marriage and that sort of thing. Well, it's fascinating history, and I'll just uh, mention again before we conclude that we're having TD as our distinguished lecturer here on Friday, September 13th. Uh, at 6 p.m. at the National Atomic Testing Museum, and a lot of people are looking forward to that uh, lecture. Please uh, RSVP at our museum. Uh, if you're not a member, it's only a $5 fee, but we're looking to have everyone attend your lecture. It should be fun. We look forward to seeing you then. You bet. Thank you.